So Watch Pitch podcasters, we're doing something different and new and interesting because we're adding a video component to this podcast. Normally, I'm sitting with a little microphone on my phone and we're talking with a guest in any location that you can imagine in addition to doing things remotely with a a Zoom or a Skype connection. Uh, Today, we get to do this in person with Chris Nicholas. And Chris, I'm thrilled to be able to have you on the Watch Pitch podcast and now video cast uh, show to kind of discover really more than anything else, sort of best practices for founders of startups and entrepreneurs. I know you've got a class coming up here that I want to talk about towards the end, but just to get us started, how do you represent your expertise and how you lend value to this ecosystem for startups and entrepreneurs? Well, first, thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me in. Um, it's an honor to have a chance to chat with you in person, but more the community. Absolutely. Um, that's a good question. I'm trying to think about where to start. So I've become uh, a passionate supporter of the founder community because of the journey that I went through. And I have messed up so much stuff. Hmm. I've just ruined um, some of my original energy that I had. Uh, I've taken the wrong ideas forward. Uh, I've used the wrong tactics and I have a failed company and a successful one in my past. And um, I've gotten a lot of poor advice and some great advice. And I, I wish I had some of the lessons I have now when I was starting. And when I, the more I've learned about founders, I've seen a very similar characteristic between the majority of them. And they tend to be a bit um, highly skilled, driven, passionate folks who believe they can make something better. And they take on the risk to go do it um, at a massive self-sacrifice. And sometimes the ultimate sacrifice, we had over 800,000 businesses go bankrupt last year. The failure rates are anywhere between 80 and 98 percent depending on your source and unfortunately mental health and even suicide is a massive issue in our industry so it's for those reasons that I'm really committed to sharing as much as I possibly can about the things that I've messed up and um, hopefully make a small impact on a handful of folks so walk us through a couple of your businesses the ones that did well and the ones that didn't uh, just so that it can create a context for other startups sure so I'm a designer by training. Um, I think my first company was, I was a magician when I was 12 and did a lot of kids' birthday parties and um, learned about things like accounting and uh, how to play with pricing. Um, I, then I ran a graphic design company. We did uh, a services business. Um, I spent 10 years on staff at the National Football League where I was in charge of a lot of the branding, like redesigning the NFL Shield, launching the NFL Network, and redesigning tons of their internal products, if you consider branding and the broadcast components as products. Mm -hmm. Um, In that experience, recognize the massive need to automate some of the painstaking work of developing hundreds of thousands of individual video assets We built some technology to render video in the cloud at an unlimited scale very cheaply. Uh, That was my first startup, and that um, was River, we called it. Uh, And the idea was to take the ability to have a template video and put a spreadsheet on it in the cloud and just crank out 10,000 videos in a a day. And this was a long time ago. Um, That was a huge failure. The technology, a huge success. Um, my relationship with my co-founder was extremely strained and almost to the point of breaking by the time we wrapped that up. And I learned a lot there. I pivoted that over to a marketing technology where we took the same idea of being able to take data and render a very large set of videos to personalize video advertising. And we had a big success there. We had a few million dollars in revenue, ran the company for a couple of years, had some really big enterprise enterprise clients 
um, and we chose to wrap that one up. Um, a handful of reasons, some personal and some we saw the technology being grown in-house at companies like Google and Apple to do the personalized video you might be familiar with, like memories from this vacation or this particular month or yeah that's it mm -hmm. um so a lot of success there and again a lot of learnings um, since then i've been doing a lot of consulting and supporting founders in person um, and through the exposure to a large set of founders recognizing some consistent things that i did wrong uh, and some lessons i've learned that i've been sharing that have been really helpful for others so that's why i'm that's why I'm here to share that. I see. So I guess one of the places I'd love to start is that co-founder relationship, because I yeah. think that one of the, the mantras entrepreneurs and startups as founders are discovering and hearing in the sort of network of best practices is co-founder, co-founder, co-founder. You can't do this independently or as a solopreneur very well. And not one person has all those skill sets. So since it seems like you've had an experience at least of what that how that didn't play out very well um knowing that in any co-founder relationship you're going to want to have a diversity of skill sets and obviously you know you're both kind of covering one another's backs for maybe weaknesses that one person has that another person doesn't and in fact has real strengths in that area and vice versa i mean you're this is about synergy you know, with resources and skill sets. Um, so I imagine that's kind of the fundamental departure point for even having that conversation about being a co-founder or bringing a co-founder on. Um, but what are the yellow flags for a co-founder relationship that to you, at least from your experience, have really got to be um, something you you need to be aware of? That's such a good question. Um I think business partners are like partners in a romantic sense. Mm -hmm. And as much experience as you can accrue to a point <laughs> up and before getting married is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so don't marry the first person you meet, uh, even though they might have a great resume or look fantastic. There is a sense of lust when you meet someone that you think you need that can be misleading. So the work is first learning what's possible, what's available. And then second, what's actually needed. So for me, I need a spouse who's detail-oriented, uh, warm and calm and loving and uh, knows how to make a great curry. I fortunately married the right person. Mm -hmm. In a co-founder, what I needed was someone who was very specifically focused on who our customers were, their existing rituals, and how we could positively impact their life. And unfortunately, what I had was a world-class engineer, which is what I felt was needed in my startup as a designer. And my design skill set lacked the understanding of market and who real people are. Mm. I was more focused, maybe arrogantly, on my design skill mm. and how beautiful I can make something look mm. and feel and function and experience. And completely missed how important it was to step back, confident in my ability to make something beautiful and function great, and really understand the problems my market is facing their existing rituals. And that's not competition analysis. That's looking at who the people are, their emotions, their behaviors, and their desires. That was missing. It's almost a therapist, a psychologist who might be able to tell me what words I should be choosing. That's more important. Startups don't fail most of the time because of product, because of technology, or because of their team. I can give examples of incredible products that failed. Amazing teams that built useless crap and burned hundreds of millions of dollars. When you go market first, and sometimes this word market is, obfuscates the 
human beings that it encapsulates. Right, because these are consumers. These are humans. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. and when we use the word like consumer and market, mm-hmm. it's easy to go Google, you know, some spreadsheet example of, uh, you know, 1% of China breakdown to get to a market saturation. All this silly MBA stuff that's more analytical after the fact instead of going out in front and spending time with human beings and watching what they do and a more ethnographic approach. Uh, so for me, to your question of co-founder, if you're missing that piece, find them. Mm-hmm. Startups fail because of market. Or people don't buy the thing you built. And if you built something no one's buying, what we missed was fully understanding the people, not missing on technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, the exception being cancer drugs or curing you know, some major medical illness. We know the market will buy that. But another rideshare app, a new to-do list, a quicker way to do X, Y, Z, you know, these kinds of things, and everything else uh, really tends to be focused on the market and those behaviors and desires. So then if you're sitting down with a potential co-founder and you know, in your case as a designer, I don't have that savvy um, or that experience with consumers and my potential market. Um, I want to be sure that co-founder has actually had a track record of some kind of kind of embedding themselves in that process and understanding it well enough to have been really successful. Um, I would Im- imagine that would be almost a starting point from your perspective in terms of ensuring that that, that skill set is on board. Yeah. As, a, as a co-founder, because, I mean, somebody has to be responsible for ensuring that you do have, in fact, consumers at the other end of your product or service that you're generating. Yeah, and I mean, I guess I want to consider the the first, the premise is co-founders required. I don't know that's the case. Hmm. might be for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I'm, sh- I'm sh- sure it's not absolutely necessary. You can have a one single person up front and if that woman fully understands that we have these set of needs really understanding our market and by market I mean the emotions of people individuals and their behaviors find that person they can be a first employee doesn't need to be co-founder I see I see and Mm -hmm. technology someone's Mm -hmm. got to be start building the engineering at some point Mm -hmm. hopefully you push the building bit as far as possible Mm -hmm. and don't build first uh, but that leader can identify if we can get something close out of popsicle sticks and bubble gum. I know I'm going to need an engineer at that some point. Um, and then let's shine it up with a good designer later. And I use that word designer and shine mostly in self-reflective kind of way mm. because there's a breed of very rare designers coming out of school right now and those coming out of um, experiences like mine, who are designing with research first, who are spending time up front, 80% of the time allotted to spend time in person, asking deep, open s- format questions, to learn how From much- those potential clients in that market? Yeah. Uh-huh. And is our market even the right one? Can we be mm-hmm. talking to someone different? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pick another hemisphere or yeah. another language and that's the design work that's more important than the shiny bit Hmm. and that's happening even on the design level sure that's so interesting to hear that that actually like what you're saying is there's a basic principle here of knowing your market knowing the people who are going to consume your product or service and you need to know that it sounds like almost as soon as you start developing your product and service like Oh, first. So first, so maybe even go to the marketplace and go, huh? What do they need? Oh my, yeah. And now I got to figure out a way to meet that need. Right. And now I'm going to go build it. So you just nailed the fundamental shift that I'm committed to bringing to as many people as I can. Uh huh. It is no longer about building it. This I will build it and they will come. Crap works mm. for Woodstock. It does not work for technology startups. Mm. They're probably not coming. over 90% of the time. 
your great idea that everyone loves and you have some early customers is going to fail because we did not do that good early work. Mm. Um, and there's a few folks like uh, Jared Spool on Twitter or Teresa Torres or Roger Calvin. I mean, these folks are really doing the work on Twitter. And when you look at some of the most successful startups and their journey, it's not, I had a great idea, built it, and everyone cheered me on and we won. That's almost never the case. And I've been searching hard to find it, but I haven't found an example of where a single solo entrepreneur quietly clanking away in his basement produced anything massively successful. You can look at Twitch, Twilio, any of the more recent exits or IPOs, their journey was a spaghetti mess of customer discovery mm. and engineering trying to keep up with the failures along the way. Boy, it sure seems like to me then that an integral part of any healthy business has to have some branch or muscle group that's completely dedicated to being in constant relationship with customers and clients. That's uh, Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, without that feedback loop, uh, you know, it, yeah. Hmm. So Jared Spool did some great research on this that he made public. It's a foundational component of the course in a building. It's everything. When you look at the most successful companies and that feedback loop that you mentioned, the key decision makers, the people making decisions on what the product is, not necessarily how it's built, but what features are we going to release? What exactly is it solving? Those folks in business, design, and engineering must be exposed to customers for at least two hours every two weeks. That means your engineer should be sitting down in person talking to a stranger. Picking up the phone. <laughs> now, there's probably nothing the more scary. Problem hotline, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. real. Uh -huh. uh, and problem hotline is a good one. Listening, uh, doing customer service is a policy some companies use that all engineers have to do. Mm. And that's helpful. I'd advise you to go a bit further downstream and have the engineer go sit with a stranger, mm. something most of us don't like, especially the engineers <laughs> I've met. <laughs> And the, but most important is a critical mind, a curiosity. And that's what engineers bring that the design and business folks don't have. So it's actually more of that criticism. And why? If you've gotten into an in-depth conversation with an engineer questioning the work you've assigned, you'll find them tend to ask why a lot. Mm. It frustrated the hell out of me early on. And now I think it's the most important step. Mm. Ask an engineer to pick apart a customer behavior or emotion, and you'll get to some source truth. That's the mindset. And unfortunately, founders tend to have a pitch and sales mindset most of the time because that's how we built. Yeah, that's how they got there. At. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's the worst way to make product decisions. So let me ask you a sort of a straddling question. Uh, between the line of really creative innovation mm. and then just meeting the marketplace with a need and basically providing a service. So what I mean to say is that, um, you know, it's like there's a great analogy that Stephen Covey has about, you know, progress with cutting a road through the jungle and, you know, the workers getting really good and really efficient at, you know, cutting trees down and uh, sharpening their machetes and having a whole routine to get really good at, at creating progress. Um, but perhaps failing at just pausing and getting up in a tree and going, are we building the road to the right place? And how important it is to, to pause in those kind of best practiced systems um, to be sure that we are going where we want to go. Um, and in this case, for, for any founder, uh, particularly at that level of I am a creator, I'm a vision maker, and I'm wanting to implement this vision to not only support the marketplace, but also to maybe create a future that um, is a better one. Uh, maybe it's something that's just with regards to like an amazing musical instrument or an amazing way to light your home or a, an amazing way to power your home or 
an amazing way to get from point A to point B. Um, you know, this is this is the straddle I think of any true founder is making sure that of course you are meeting the marketplace and you fully understand your customer. Um, but then are you also inspired enough by your vision that that may have as a core part of it really wanting to make a difference and and not just responding to the marketplace, but maybe even leading the marketplace. Um, and and I guess that's that's where to me, you know, how, how do you make sure that the soul of a visionary leader is intact as they address the needs of the marketplace? Now, now we know what that looks like going the other way because you've had a, a failure. You know what it likes to maybe have that, that vision and realize, well, okay, my vision was awesome, but the market didn't meet me. Um, and and that was a legitimate failure. But on the other hand, if in fact you have that that balanced relationship of not only your your vision and your soul and 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 how you want to you know create a maybe a new marketplace or a new product, but also then meeting the needs of the marketplace. I'm curious how 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 a founder does that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You're right. And and it's okay because people are kind of experimenting with this all the time. Um, I guess another way to approach this is to maybe peel back a layer here without giving away all of the secret sauce of this class um, that you have coming up. Um, what are some of the best practices that you're really emphasizing for founders and generally people and entering the marketplace it sounds like spending time with your customers is a real big part of it what are some other elements that have to be sort of baked into operations there's so much there it's great i'll give you everything i got no problem i want to I'll give all the secrets i that i've <laughs> uh you know at least the lessons i've learned from messing stuff up um awesome okay so there's a lot of stuff in there so i'm going to poke at what I, what comes up for me and if you want to direct me Please do. Will do. First, get clear on if you're building art or a business. The market doesn't care. Right. About your spirit. They will suck all of it and kick you to the ground and move on without a blink. You are not building art if you're trying to make a successful business, especially a technology one. There is art in the process. There's art in listening to your customer. There's art in color selection to drive an emotional response. There's art in navigating the relationships of your team. But the work it product is not art, meaning consumed for desire, unless of course, or, uh, pleasure, but unless of course you're, you're building art and that's your business. Awesome. I think a lot of business thinking should be brought to most artists. And that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Hmm. So getting clear on what exactly you're doing. Most technical folks that go build a company do it out of frustration of an experience. And they build to grow their skills. Consciously or not. They pick a new gem. They want to upgrade the what they're running the server with or they want to try some ml and kafka cluster cluster cool that's great hobby work it's not a business so getting clear on that is really important and it's really hazy because we're never trained about that what we're given as aspiration and and a, a roadmap for building a startup is like Iron Man, you know, he's, or this farce that Steve Jobs just farts perfect products. Apple does m an enormous amount of customer research. They spend hundreds of hours in person talking to people every day. It is not the original genius of any person. We're not building the Iron Man suit in the basement by ourselves. We're human beings entangled with other human beings trying to marginally improve their life such that they'll give us some money. 
So the work is very difficult. It's introspective. It's a spiritual work to be introspective enough to separate what you want and the fun and art and vision you want, which has more to be more to do with how you want to be seen by others. Mm. And to separate that from getting really vulnerable to ask a stranger, can you spend an hour or two with me? I want to learn about your life. If you can do that a hundred times and really listen, and I mean deeply listen, like you've never listened before, you'll know exactly what to build. And it's going to be a lot smaller and simpler than you thought. So do you have going into that conversation with a potential client or an existing client uh, a set of, you got to ask this question, um, of questions um, that are sort of key and essential or um, is it is it open-ended enough to just ask them how they feel when they interact with your product? I mean, I, I wonder if you have a an approach um, – or a template that really is kind of the best way to get to the information you need from that potential customer I or do. existing customer. Um, I have a set of seven questions that I can share with you and your audience. Anyone can download this PDF. Great. I actually, I just built it. It's amazing. And it, it should really help shift you in that direction. It's not a magic bullet. It's a good start, but there isn't a, um, these only, only these questions. It's more about a mindset. And a massive shift, and it's an uncomfortable one, from sell-convince behavior to curiosity. And what that looks like are open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. They're eliciting story from the person you're talking to. It's building trust and comfort through vulnerability. So they can share with you how they feel and what they actually did. And the right types of questions, and I go over this in the PDF in detail, are the criteria look like open-ended. So that is not, did you like that feature? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, what did you do yesterday? And they're like, I don't know. What do you mean? Well, you, no, yesterday, actually, what did you do? You, did you get up early? Seeding it a little, letting them tell you. And then small responses like, mm-hmm. got it. That's those types of responses and follow-up questions that sound something like, I heard you say this, repeat back what they had said. Can you tell me more about that? It's not on a scale of one to 10. Would you use this service or product, right? Standard stuff that I still see in my, the poll that I get from Twitter on like customer satisfaction. Um, And as often as possible, those ought to be done in person where you can make eye contact, see their posture, listen for intonation and an opportunity to open up something more relevant to your product. So how would you get started with that process? Like, Uh, first some planning, you want to understand all the stuff you're thinking about doing. Are we going to build this? Are we, you know, have to figure out pricing, where are we going to advertise? Whatever, the, whatever it is for you at your phase of the company. Do we need in, you know, to raise money? Do I have to figure finish this box on my business model canvas? You know, what is the, the thing? I'll go off on business model canvas if you want me to later. Um, so first step is plan. Write down all the things that you're thinking about building. What's your plan right now? Once those are really clear, let's look at them ordered by risk. Which one of those could have a massive impact, not on your business, on the customer? So the riskiest ones are those that could have small impact on the person and high cost on you and your energy or your money. Feature development, you know. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Rolling our own XYZ, Mm -hmm. big chunk of technology Mm -hmm. or, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So if they're high cost, low impact on your customer... Let's put those at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now let's look for really simple things that could have a huge impact on someone else's life. For Airbnb, it was just taking their pictures of their place for them. Not hard to do. Has a massive impact 
on the, per the perception of the property, turns out a huge success. Um, so that's the next step, ordering those. Then let's pick two or three keep, to keep a focus that have high impact on our customer, potential low risk to build, and set up a few questions or, that would disprove our hypothesis. I'll say that again. You want some questions that will disprove your hypothesis. The reason for that is our brains are wired for confirmation. If you ask something to validate it, you will. Even if it's not the case. Most people do this just by Googling what they want to be true. You can find a stat or an example of just about anything from the world's flat to we didn't go to the moon. It's the opposite we're looking for. And the classic example is the black swan. So if you think all swans are white, don't go looking for white swans. Let's go find a black one. So let's take those hypotheses you have. Write a question that could disprove it. So for instance, using the Airbnb example, if you were to go to a Airbnb host who has a property, um, what would be one of the disproving questions that you would ask them that would um, maybe discourage them from being an Airbnb host? Because ultimately Airbnb would be interested in ensuring to that host that, you know, this is a great portal for you to represent your property. And we have X, Y, and Z in place for you um, to really support you as a entrepreneur with your home. Um, so what would be, just so I can wrap my head around a disproving sure. question. Um, so the, in that example, we can use the photo, taking the photographs. Those increase the perceived value of the property for the buyer. Correct. So I might go bring photos to five, seven potential buyers. A set that's terrible, the set that's great. And you can run an experiment a handful of ways. Mm -hmm. Which one would you rather? Mm -hmm. Or just show the good ones to five and the bad ones to five. You know, that type of work that can work to extract bias from the process and understand a, a core business opportunity. That's helpful. Yeah. So that would be that step. And there's lots of background on this in the history of the scientific method. So pseudoscience is often defined as all validation work, mm -hmm. no invalidation work. Right, right. right. Um, so doing some research on proper hypothesis development and good scientific method is where the source of this stuff lies. Uh, once we get to those questions, the hard work is in recruiting. You have to ask strangers to spend an hour or two with you, in person if possible. That's hard work. And what comes up for most of us is a fear of rejection, consciously or not, that holds us back. Yeah, there's some hard work to do, but founders are not scared of hard work. But some of that social anxiety comes up. And we say, you know what? I'm just going to build the thing. It's actually easier to do 10 times the amount of work, which is a much higher risk potential, than to have someone tell you, I don't want to talk to you. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Most people say, let's go raise some money so I can build all this technology so that people will buy this thing that I've got this great idea. I know it's going to work. Do you? <laughs> talk to some people first. Right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, I'll talk to founders about this. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's great best practices, Chris. You're right, you're right. But I have all these bills I have to get out. And this two people are calling me right now. I have to put this fire out. And, and then three years later, they're completely burnt out. Mm -hmm. They've lost their house to a mortgage. Their relationships are barely holding together. And they're looking for a job on an Indeed.com. All so that they could keep building and putting out fires. And they don't understand that there's actually this low level social anxiety, like reptilian fear of being kicked out of the tribe. And you're going to die alone. That's driving you away from asking 10 strangers if they have an hour. And now we're at 98% failure rates. 
Awesome. So when looking now at the arc of your class, you have this coming up uh, when? Are you launching? Yeah, we have a pilot now. So uh-huh, okay, uh, the price great. is really low, but uh-huh. um, if any of your folks want to jump in, we'll do something special for them. But mm-hmm. in the fall, we'll be releasing it. Okay, great. And uh, for a founder, co-founder, for yeah. other people, how do you who do you see as the right person to take this class? Look, it's... Anyone that has an idea that's a first-time founder on a technical product uh, all the way through having a successful company that feels stuck. If you're feeling stuck, I guarantee you the answers lie in your talking to people Mm. from marketing Mm -hmm. to developing which feature to leading an enterprise team. I've done it. Three-person team and a 23-person team. Uh, the answers lie in that customer work. And we go through in detail how our lazy brain is holding us back, what some of those biases are, how to label them and get over them, and how to make a big breakthrough. So if you are literally a solo founder just starting out that are committed to moving forward up through an enterprise and person that's in charge of a product, um, it's not for uh, just engineers that are looking to do great engineering. I'm not going into deliverability, but more discovery. Mm. It's not for MBAs and super detailed uh, business folks that want a more academic approach. I dropped out of college. I don't care about the academics. I'm here to support on the ground badass founders who want to put a dent in the universe and equip them with some of these lessons I've learned and a handful of skills that can make a huge impact. So when you look at that arc of the journey through your class from we're going to start here and we're going to end up here, what does that look like? Um, The arc. So in other words, I would imagine that in designing the class, there was some like, okay, let's start here. We're actually going to go you know, roll up our sleeves, put our boots on. We're going to actually go do something experiential. You're going to actually have conversations with people. Yeah. Um, And then you're going to come out with something that I would imagine would be some version of, we just kick, you know, 30 holes into your proposed business that got you through the front door that you wanted help with, or we just found 30 opportunities for you to refine what you have So that now you are empowered with now a refined idea of really what your marketplace is like. And now you're empowered with not only now this experience of going through a process, but also with with some genuine insights to make the adjustments to to really be probably a lot more successful than had you not gone through this arc. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, there's some great stuff in there. I really love the course some tools, some worksheets, homeworks, Mm -hmm. and community that we're building there. If you go through that and do the work, you will have a more successful company. But you don't need to do it. You don't have to grab this course. You don't need to do any of this stuff. If you go talk to people in your market with a curious mindset, you're going to have a huge step forward. Mm. You'll get stuck again, and then I'll come yell at you to do it again. Go talk to 10, 50, 100 more folks. And listen, um, so the arc is of discovery and you're not going to be more sure after this. You'll be less sure. And that's the most beautiful thing. We'll be able to organize and prioritize so you'll know exactly what to do next. But you've, <laughs> you're going to feel a, a little discomfort with how much new stuff you've realized you don't know. So let me ask you then, um, if if you've gotten a potential founder or an existing founder a little more uncomfortable, um, how, because normally, like, this is just personal reflection, you know, if I'm uncomfortable, I'm probably less likely to take action. Um, in some cases, I think as a, you know, startup entrepreneur founder, Myself, there's not a lot of fear about 
taking some kind of action. But if in fact where I'm finding myself is perhaps less confident um, because now I've gotten all this input from my clients or my potential customers or my existing customers, um, you know, the first thing I can think of doing is just pausing. You know, it's, it's not about action at this point. It's really about, you know, distilling what I learned and, and now figuring out a way to meet those needs and not necessarily the need for more. It's so great. Yes. Um, it's an action bias. We, we're kind of steeped in it right now. The, Big time. Like, I mean, this is startups and entrepreneurs. I mean, it's... Yeah. <laughs> that just says action guys and girls. Right. You know? Like, we go get shit done. Yeah, exactly. Like, to your analogy before, cool, which way is the road going? Hmm. Um, because it does. It takes a piece of energy to get something done. And we have finite energy. So, really, it's not about doing more. It's about doing less. Really massively impactful stuff. And often that's where the scary stuff is. So, founders are biased uniquely for massive action. They're a little bit um, wary where it means exposing their spirit to people's criticisms. Now we can push through it, right? Everyone says, you're not going to make it. Cool, you can pe- keep pushing. Good job. That's yeah. great. Work, work, hard work. Right, this yeah. mm-hmm. grussel, this yeah. hustle porn, <laughs> grind, crap. It's right, just right. a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, what I, I want founders to do less work. <laughs> I want us, if they've got kids, see your kids. Work nine to four, man. Or just go get a job if you don't. Now, there's a lot of times you're going to be burning the midnight oil and, and really pushing. Got to do that. But what I want to offer is that there's a set of uncomfortable things that you can do that can give you some clarity on prioritizing that list of what to do next. And it's very simple. How can we make an impact on some other people? Call them a customer, a market, a demographic, some uh, persona, whatever. There's actual human beings out there that as a founder, you have the will and skill to improve. And what's good for your market or those individual peoples is going to be great for your business. Right, because they're bona fide customers. Now they love what you, because you're meeting their needs. Nice. So uh, how can people find out about the class? Oh, yeah. So uh, hopefully I'll throw you a link. You can put something up. Okay. Um, it's hackingcustomers.com. Um, we're running a pilot right now, and we'll launch in the course in fall. Or they can find me through you. Anyone wants to connect, I'd be happy to uh, yell at you, get you accountable to go talk to some people. All right. Nice. And is there anything that we haven't talked about that you really wanted to be sure that listeners knew? or understood yeah you are good your idea is not you notice when your identity gets entangled with an idea that's great it's it's so healthy to be able to, you know, pull those two apart because absolutely we get so identified with our idea being a reflection of ourself and any judgment on that idea can, it's really natural to internalize that and really beat ourselves up. And I think creating some distance between those two, even though they're integrally related, feels really healthy. Yeah. Nice. Chris, thanks so much for being on the Watch Pitch podcast and live cast with video.